Yes, I was introducing Dr. Malem. So uh, he's, he has a very long experience on product and business development activities in applied superconductivities uh, on uh, low and high temperature superconductors, cryogenics, nanotechnology applications. Uh, he has led the development of the world's first 22.5 Tesla research magnet. And recently, his program managed to successfully complete the new generation of high field wide bore superconducting magnets. Uh, used as uh, um, low TC um, outserts for superconducting magnets uh, over 25 Tesla. So a uh, lot of things we will hear, I, I hope, uh, today from uh, Dr. Melhem. So I leave the floor to him, and he will talk about commercialization of superconducting uh, applications. Um, thank you very much. and. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Valeria, for the introduction, and thanks, um, um, Ali, for the invitation to give this um, uh, update on the commercialization of superconducting technologies. Um, so the outline of my talk will be uh, started with a brief introduction, followed by some of the challenges required for commercializing superconducting magnets, what are the markets, uh, some market data to help understand the size of the opportunity, and then I will go um, to the bulk of my talk to, 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 to go through some of the opportunities available now on superconducting um, applications and a brief uh, concluding remark. So, so very briefly, uh, almost over 110 years ago, um, uh, uh, honest discovered by accident superconductivity and over the last um, uh, 110 years we've seen major um, development either in the theory of superconductivity or quantum theory or in the discovery of um, materials which uh, work at low temperatures it took almost 50 years to demonstrate the first superconducting wire and in 1960, this superconducting wire was used to um, to do uh, to develop the first commercial superconducting magnet um, by Oxford Instrument. Within 10 years, in the early 70s, we saw the first commercial MRI body scanner, which led to a step change in performance of healthcare around the world. And uh, high energy physics benefited enormously from um, the discoveries of superconductivity. Together, MRI and um, hi, um, hi, hi, high energy physics uh, and the particle accelerators led to wide uh, development of superconducting materials for um, diverse application, but also led to discovery of new superconducting materials. There are many sectors and applications benefited from superconductivity in various sectors, life sciences, uh, materials discovery, semiconductor research, healthcare, and energy generation. Um, not to mention nanotechnology in its diverse um, uh, aspects. So superconductivity has enabled very um, critical impact on um, various um, aspects of our life for the last 60 years. And uh, this has been dominated primarily by um, uh, MRI systems as a commercial product, followed by an MR. But if you look at the history of evolution of these um, uh, discoveries, it took only till 1980 to start to see um, volume production of MRI body scanners, but also seen in the 80s, the discovery of high temperature superconductors. And in the last 20 years, we start to see emergence of high energy, um, uh, high, high magnetic fields and energy application and large scale application like ITER um, using low temperature superconductors. Nowadays, we are entering a new era, a new frontier of, um, of superconducting technologies driven primarily by high temperature superconductors. We start to see the emergence of ultra high field magnets beyond 20 Tesla. And um, I wouldn't be surprised you will see 40 Tesla within 10 years. Currently, um, um, you can have access to a 32 Tesla fully superconducting magnet at Florida, 
we start to see the emergence of power and energy application and large scale systems like new accelerators for high energy physics and fusion. But more importantly, uh, we start to see the impact of environment and decarbonization on transport. Superconducting can be potentially um, a primary player in um, delivering electric planes, for example. Um, if you look at uh, the various aspects of superconducting applications, we've been, it's been dominated primarily by MRI and uh, basic uh, research, physical sciences and high energy physics. Fusion, for example, driven by ITER and currently by um, some private companies on using high temperature superconductors. The rest of the sectors, which although would have benefited from uh, superconducting, primarily were demonstrators or prototypes. Very few had made it become a commercial product. In fact, uh, in terms of power and energy applications, your own, the only um, commercial system you can buy now is a fault current limiter or a transmission cable. The rest are still prototype or demonstrators. And there are, I will go some of the challenges why is that happening. So some of the challenges is really to do with the material. So this is in one slide, I'm showing here how the science research into materials at the 50 nano millimeter scale led development of filamentary superconductors and a wire which is one millimeter size, which can carry current more, ten, 10 times more what can a typical copper wire can do. That's where the potential, you can have high current capacity in these superconducting materials, allowing super currents go through small scale um, 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 uh, materials and wires to enable um, development of devices not possible otherwise. And uh, here in very simple um, uh, slide, I'm showing how this 50 nanometer lattice in, um, uh, in the research lab, um, you know, the studied and characterized can lead to large systems like a fusion here for ether, for example, 35 meter. So superconducting can really um, uh, impact um, uh, really many aspects of uh, future applications. So, however, if you come to these uh, uh, superconducting materials, uh, there are over 4,000, 4, 5,000 materials being researched over the last 50 years. It's dominated by um, four phases. The first phase of initial discovery from 1900 till 1950, which culminated in the development of niobium titanium. In the 80s, we've seen um, uh, the EPCO type material, the cuprates. And nowadays, we start to see nectides, another class of materials. And um, in the last two years, we start to see demonstration of room, room temperature um, superconductors. So these are the three or uh, four phases. Most of the applications um, nowadays rely on the use of six practical materials. These are the low temperature superconductors, niobium titanium and niobium tin, which can take you up to critical temperature of 18 Kelvin. Then the medium uh, temperature of magnesium diboride around uh, 40 Kelvin. And then the high temperature, which is PISCO and EPCO material, we can take you between 90 and 110 Kelvin. And that's what we re refer to as high temperature superconductors. So out of these thousands of materials, only six made it to enough practical um, length to allow um, the um, use of uh, these um, smart materials into applications. Um, Arno uh, uh, yesterday gave a very good uh, update on high temperature superconductors for commercial magnets. And I will not go into uh, too much details onto these superconducting conductors or what I will, I will advise you to go through that to give you an, uh, some, some information about these materials. But really the message here that uh, superconducting materials is enabling a new class of applications. Um, what you will find that almost 90% of uh, superconducting application um, really uh, utilizing niobium titanium. This is a cheap um, uh, material, um, uh, ducta, uh, um, 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 easy to use and available in, in affordable price. All MRI systems nowadays, the commercial ones up to 
even up to um, seven Tesla use the Yabum Tenium material uh, and uh, have uh, the critical temperature of 10 uh, Kelvin and it might take you up to 11 Tesla around 1.8 Kelvin. Uh, if you are uh, require um, performance above 11 Tesla, you need to use niobium 10, which is allow you to go to 23 Tesla around 2 Kelvin. Anything above that, you have to rely on high temperature superconductors. Another challenge is the um, uh, helium supply. So up till 10 years ago, any system required um, uh, working at low temperature will require uh, will need helium. Helium is a really a very um, expensive commodity, and um, very few locations ar around the world provide that commodity. It's a byproduct of oil or gas wells, and the major suppliers are Qatar, for example, Algeria, Russia, and the US. And, uh, Every year we are seeing an increase in the price of um, helium. And um, if you look at the at annual use over the last um, 10 years, you could see that the supply of helium is, um, uh, is really not enough to address the demand. There's in increased demand of um, uh, use of helium driven by MRI of 20% of helium used by MRI systems, the welding in industrial, um, uh, industrial uh, projects, about 17%, um, and um, lifting and balloons, 8%, um, other cryogenics, 14 So you could see these are the primary driver for uh, helium use, and this is not going, uh, is not going uh, um, down. So if we keep the same use of helium till 2027, then the, it, the supply will not be enough. And just last year, I, um, I think um, Qatar uh, um, released a new well, which will take us to uh, 2023 if there's no increase in helium use. If you imagine 1.5% increase in hel helium use, then you are hit with the challenge, not enough. Hence the price increasing by 20%. In fact, last year increased by, before the COVID, it was increased by 30%. And if the, the uh, supply uh, is still not available for us in the coming um, uh, five years, I'm expecting it will become even more expensive. Hence, a new solutions in cryogenic is required to enable um, um, a wider use of superconducting system. So hence, a cryogen-free system is a critical enabler. And that's one of the challenges of superconducting to provide what we call high performance and um, high efficiency and low cost cryogenic solutions. I think this is one of the things the community has to work on. The other thing I want to show here, the diversity of these applications and what the operating field. So it's not only that the low temperature, but also the field application. So majority of um, um, uh, application working at around 4K, 2 to 4K, and that's commercially is driven by MRI systems and NMR magnets. And currently, NMR magnet can go to up to 30 Tesla or research magnet. MRI can go for commercially to three Tesla, but also seven Tesla if you want to do research. But all, all these systems are working uh, around two to four K. Uh, however, there's a huge class of systems which can benefit working at uh, high temperatures. We, in, in the last month, we saw um, a Commonwealth Fusion System and at MIT, with MIT demonstrated um, 20 Tesla system uh, running at 20 Kelvin and um, in, um, in a large uh, coil for fusion application. This is a step change in the performance and start, I think, to see the emergence of new class of um, applications running at above 20 Kelvin up to, say, probably 40 Kelvin. There's another suite of um, power and energy application will benefit to operate at high operating temperature. I class them around the 40K. And the reason I class them around 40K is where you can get one stage cryo cooler running at, four, uh, at 40, 45 Kelvin, which will enable a new class of products. 
if you are struggling with uh, cryogenics. And of course, you have the fault current limiters and cables and transformers working around liquid nitrogen. All these are opportunities really for superconducting. If you can get um, um, high temperature uh, superconducting material operating at, um, at high operating temperature, then you will, it will really enable um, a new uh, era in using the smart material. So what are the market? Uh, currently, if I sh share with you the forecast for a market um, um, uh, expansion of superconductivity, um, you, you, you would say you would see that it's dominated by MRI in the early stage. The green one is MRI, then the followed by science and research and development, including high energy physics and the NMR. These are the three really dominant uh, applications nowadays. And as, as we see the HTS start to be deployed further into new application, you start to see from 2025 onward the emergence of uh, new applications. And I'm expecting that within a decade, you will see that almost 40% of new superconducting products will be using high temperature superconductors. And the increase of the market will go, uh, grow up almost by um, uh, um, twice the current market. And that's quite significant, I think. If you look um, on the number of suppliers of these superconductor products, nowadays we, can, we, we could say easily we have about 60, 70 companies directly dealing with um, superconducting material supply and uh, a production of uh, components. But uh, three of them are dominating the market nowadays. Germany with 14 companies, Italy with nine, and Spain. And uh, these and the rest, you will find a few players here and there. In the US and Japan, you, I, I'm sharing here the primary suppliers who are dedicated to superconducting applications. There's others who are really have them as a component. So this is an, represent the, uh, another opportunity for expansion of superconducting companies. You can't look at the, the commercialization of superconductivity without looking at the patents landscape. So here in the last 20 years, steadily the patents, which is re, uh, represent the new innovation in superconducting exploitation, was uh, around between uh, 1,000 and 1,200 every year till we start to see in 2017, 18, and 19, a sudden increase, almost double, in the number of superconducting applications and uh, we hit by the COVID and we can see that the, this is actual data of number of patents has been uh, submitted and, um, and um, um, uh, granted over the last 20 years. I'm expecting from next year, this, this um, trend line will go upward again. And within two, three years, I'm expecting is to exceed 2000. Um, uh, patents because there's so much activities happening nowadays which will be uh, um, free and released by the end of COVID. The other dominant uh, aspect of these patents, uh, majority are on magnetic field, uh, how to create magnetic field in different shapes. On superconducting wire is very is still a, a lot of um, uh, IP created in that area. How to prepare uh, materials and applications still a big area. And of course, uh, the um, uh, quantum technology if, uh, and uh, superconductor quantum, uh, quantum technologies is also big. And there's a lot of other um, applications like high temperatures and current leads. So now I'll, it allows me to go through the opportunities. And um, here we have, I will start with the approach for nanotechnology. Um, this is the, the, um, the, the, uh, the primary um, market for um, developing a new application. You start from the research uh, lab, and currently you start to see many of these research um, uh, systems for physical sciences, for material discovery, for research, uh, for in diverse applications, operating up to 18 Tesla um, at uh, 4K. And uh, these are currently most of the um, uh, physics labs or engineering lab will have one of these systems. We start to see integrating of these um, uh, superconducting systems with um, optics or um, uh, high frequency applications, and also discovering of new materials and new science in high field systems like national labs, 
or like uh, NMR systems, which uh, Broker have just released uh, the 1.2 gigahertz fully superconducting system, which is opening a new era of discovery in uh, bio um, materials. So really, the, this is quite a diverse um, um, sector, but really that's where ideas of new materials will be experimented first. And here showing the history of um, superconducting uh, high field systems and really driven primarily by the materials capabilities. So uh, up to 10 Tesla using niobium titanium, up to 20 Tesla using niobium tin. And now we start to see the emergence of 30 Tesla plus using high temperature superconductors. And the other challenge is basically how to make these systems small. So not just making the magnet um, um, uh, powerful, but you need to come with the new engineering solutions and new materials to ensure the size doesn't grow in a linear and exponential way. The other area which is really gaining a lot of momentum is in quantum applications. And uh, I will focus here on uh, quantum computing and superconductor qubits. Uh, there are big industrials working on um, superconducting computing uh, like IBM, Google, um, Dicati, and uh, Intel, and D-Wave. Um, D-Wave is the first commercial company to offer a quantum computer using superconducting qubits. And IBM has demonstrated uh, 65 qubits um, this year, and they're promising 125 next year. So there is a, a, a sector which is moving very quickly, and uh, currently superconducting qubits regarded as the front runner for offering a quantum computer solution. Um, another area which benefiting from superconductivity is measurements, quantum metrology and measurements. Really, there's a need uh, to start to employ the um, high uh, accuracy of measurements in industrial environments. So here I'm showing an example of how the quantum hole effect discovered in 1980 led to a commercial product in over uh, uh, 40 years, where instead of doing the calibration of uh, resistance in a national facility to get the high accuracy of uh, resistance measurements, you can have it now um, in a, a using graphene and low field systems in, uh, in an industrial environment. It's showing how that um, superconducting um, technology with smart materials is allowing to go not just in the lab, for research and um, discovery, but also for solving real life problems like uh, industrial production and accuracy of measurements in the lab environment. The th another one which is really, um, a, 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 I would like to highlight an opportunity is the MEG for brain um, sensing. They're relying on superconductor qubit or squids. And the market now is about uh, 300, 350, which will grow probably to 500 within five years. This is a, can be accelerated if um, advanced superconducting materials we can be realized. So the, another, another potential system which will have an impact on um, life sciences. Another area which is also in quantum technology is communications. So uh, communicating um, at low temperatures will provide uh, advanced uh, secure systems or, uh, or a clustering of quantum computing into uh, using superconducting uh, devices. This is another opportunity where I would expect to see um, a demonstration of teleportation, teleportation and entanglement of quantum devices within five years in large scale applications. The next one, which is um, a quite large one, is the healthcare, mainly an MRI, an MR, and proton therapy. So the evolution of uh, MRI systems over the last 40 years from the first one, so, so many uh, first, from large uh, unshielded systems to compact um, um, three Tesla actively shielded systems. And this is currently represent la the largest sector in superconducting commercial products. It's about four systems made every year and all of them are using low temperature superconductors and the market is exceeding 5 billion uh, euro per year, for example. 
uh, in the last year, uh, CA has com- uh, demonstrated 11.7 Tesla 500 megahertz system for brain um, research, and that represents the ultimate in large MRI systems for body scanners. There's also 15 Tesla with smaller, um, um, s- smaller bore for research. However, the majority of MRIs are really um, driven by the clinical um, systems in hospitals, uh, 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla. 3 Tesla represent a third of the market and 1.5, two thirds of the market. And this is going to continue expanding because the needs of healthcare is very diverse and and the needs to, to go outside big cities to provide um, high quality um, um, health care is going to be a large driver for MRI systems. Um, here I'm showing that uh, despite all these various systems have been developed, um, still dominated by clinical MRI for up to three Tesla, laboratory MRI for seven, nine Tesla, and special and future MRI. And the bore, the majority of the bore are below. 400 millimeter for animal research or for um, limbs and so on but uh, for uh, for body systems uh, you only have the 1.5 and the 3 tesla uh, anomar is a, 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 the second largest superconducting magnet uh, commercial product after mri it's uh, it's a market almost 1.2 uh, billion euro every year and um, it, currently we start to see the emergence of systems above a 25 tesla um, uh, offered as a commercial product by Procker. and this is using low temperature superconductors like naive titanium and the ribco material and uh, this is going to be really a driver not just for high field systems but also for compact system so I'm expecting this new um, um, materials will enable a new class of high field systems in a benchtop environment in the coming 10 years. And that's another opportunity for the scientists to have uh, low cost, uh, low operating systems to um, fast track innovation. Uh, medical therapy, this is, um, uh, Arno touched that uh, on his talk um, um, yesterday. Again, commercial accelerator for proton therapy and relying on um, LTS, but HTS will provide new opportunities and could be the next MRI in hospitals. If you can make these systems small, then most uh, large hospitals will have um, uh, medical therapy for various um, uh, treatment, primarily for cancer. And that, again, will make a step change in applications. And you can buy them nowadays from Varian or Hitachi or Mitsubishi. I will here not mention about the high energy physics. Uh, there are two um, primarily driven by CERN International Program uh, and LHC. So there's, if, um, there's um, a lot of um, activity happening over the last 40 years in the, providing this uh, accelerator up to 11 Tesla. But nowadays there's big program, um, the FCC program for the future um, um, uh, uh, colliders in Geneva with 100 kilometer um, ring, uh, running uh, at least um, at 16 Tesla with plans to go even to um, uh, 20 Tesla. This will require uh, high temperature superconductors and uh, there's a design study uh, working uh, currently in progress into developing the next class of these um, um, uh, colliders. The challenge is you need high critical um, uh, density material. The cost is very expensive. The length of material, how to make long length wires to take uh, care of the large systems and it has to operate at high operating field to demonstrate it in large systems. And really, the simple fact is there's enough materials to make these large systems. Um, so that's why the quest for cheap superconducting material is, uh, is going on. And China is addressing that. China um, a st- a strategy is saying we probably might be struggling using um, niobium, titanium, and tin for cost primarily. 
Uh, how about using neckties? So they're having another um, uh, proton collider uh, in China program, which is uh, relying on um, ion-based superconductors. And uh, the Chinese think they can reduce the cost significantly if they rely on these cheap materials, if it's demonstrated. So it shows that these are really drivers for um, a new class of superconductors. If it's realized within 10 years, I'm expecting it will make a, um, a step change in application. Having very cheap um, materials is critical to the wide use of superconducting applications. Power and energy is the one which is really have a lot of potential. Um, um, energy with HTS like fusion generators, uh, storage, and so on. And if you look at the TRL, the um, uh, technology readiness level of these materials, currently superconductors, uh, superconductor fault current limiters and cables are really at an advanced stage of TRL. Prototype system and demo system has been demonstrated. And in fact, you can buy super current uh, fault current limiter and uh, a cables. You can buy them as a product currently. These are available, not in large quantities, but they are available. The next class of uh, power application, which will probably start to make in way into the um, um, a wider use are generators. Uh, storage systems and transformers and storage system and generator, I think the, the one which will probably see um, uh, a major uh, uh, development and a new, uh, a completely new opportunity in superconducting applications. Fusion, and uh, this is, you can't talk about uh, superconducting without talking about fusion. ITER is one of the largest um, um, uh, programs um, in terms of um, uh, use of superconducting and uh, currently the uh, ITER is very um, in the middle of demonstrating um, uh, the superconducting system. Uh, they are completed um, various coils and in the process of assembling them. So this is a great achievement for technology on large scale. Uh, but as you can see, the size is enormous. And there are new uh, companies uh, private, uh, um, driven by private uh, investment in exploiting high temperature superconductor into fusion. I will mention here too, there's probably others, but I will mention the Commonwealth Fusion System at MIT, which last month has demonstrated a 20 Tesla at 20 Kelvin with 40 kilo amp in one coil, which is about two meter height um, tw uh, and uh, having a 120 megajoule stored energy. And uh, that's a really a, a, a milestone in demonstrating high temperature superconductor in large scale application. This will be a size equivalent to the first prototype, which is called the Spark by, uh, by MIT. And they think within five years, they will demonstrate energy from uh, fusion using HTS. And five years for all they will have a commercial one using um, uh, um, uh, 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 the ARC, which can give you 200 megawatt really in a compact size. You can see the size of these systems compared to the size of ITER. So it's almost the fix, almost 15, 20% the size of ITER. And just show the potential from HTS. HTS will make a really uh, demonstrating um, high performance and low cost of HTS will make a step change in opportunities in diverse applications. Um, um, three years ago, we saw the first EcoSwing um, is, um, wind power generation into the grid in Holland has been demonstrated. And that also pro uh, provide uh, a, a lot of opportunities in superconducting uh, motors and, um, and, uh, and um, a power train in, inside uh, for uh, the wind farm applications. I think this is another potential system which will probably be we see we will see more of these systems on the grid uh, relying on superconducting energy storage as uh, all these distributed systems will require conditioning the power conditioning is going to be a driver and represent an opportunity for superconducting where you need um, um uh, storage systems uh, if you remember the wind um to generate um the wind power you need wind and it's not always uh, guaranteed 24 uh, uh, 24 hours uh, seven days a week so you need to have um, um, contingency 
um, and redundancy in your power generation. And in fact, this year, um, some countries reverted to coal power station to address the demand. Uh, there is solar power as well, but again, you need the sun to create that um, power. So st um, storage system with um, high efficiency is required for um, power conditioning, and I'm expecting there will be big demand for the grid distribution to have a uh, storage systems. And as soon as you bring these uh, systems, um, the cost of materials down in price, I think that will represent a, a large um, uh, opportunity for superconducting. I will mention a little bit about industrial with like non-destructive testing, inductive heaters, magnetic separation, and crystal growth. This is another opportunity which, if the cost of materials goes down, will represent, you start to see factories like aluminium or stainless steel losing um, induction heaters for um, induction heaters for uh, manufacturing high quality materials. Um, it's like magnetic separation in mines, how to, how, uh, how to, do, um, to do this magnetic separation at the source. Uh, this is an example of a system which is uh, really installed in the Amazon. Uh, it's a very harsh environment, a five Tesla with up to 1000 meter bore to do magnet separation at source. At the, um, uh, so it just shows even using helium, you can do it in, in a dirty environment. Transport, and this is another a large opportunity. And uh, I will mention about the magnet and the electric planes. So currently Japan is leading in the world in terms of um, um, electric planes using superconductors. They have demonstrated, I think 200 um, uh, kilometers now and uh, up to 600 um, uh, 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 a kilometer per hour. And in fact, uh, this is going to make a step change in transport in Japan. China is just announced that they're having, uh, a, a, again, um, two um, superconductive planes by 2030 between uh, Guangzhou, uh, Shanghai, which will uh, drop the, uh, the, uh, the travel time to two and a half hours. That's really significant. So I think superconductor will enable that. And the, the sooner we see lower cost materials, more of these um, high performance trends will be operating. If it, in the future, I'm expecting travel up to 500, 600 kilometer in the world will be driven by electric planes. And so you can do that in within one hour, one hour and two hours in Europe or in the US or in, um, uh, in China and Japan. That's going to be, and that will make a major impact on the environment. We know about the decarbonization target and air flight. So this will be a driver for um, future um, reduction in the carbon emissions. Planes sorry, is- another. sorry, you have about- uh, seven minutes more. Yes, yeah, I, I almost finished, I think. So electric plane is going to be um, a driver and uh, currently uh, with the decarbonization target of 2050, we expect to see um, a major um, impact uh, in terms of developing electric planes. In fact, all the suppliers um, of, um, electric, uh, of planes are looking at electric ones. NASA is leading on it, and Boeing and um, Airbus are developing their own electric planes. In fact, um, Airbus has committed to develop an elect uh, to introduce an electric plane by 2035, and this is one of their the ascent project, showing that's where they think the future electric plane will be using liquid hydrogen and superconducting components like the direct current cable, the electric motor and the alternative current cable will be using superconducting with potentially for forward current limit to be superconducting. This um, will provide 50% of power train weight reduction and 50% electric losses and a reduction in the voltage required to less than 500 volt. This is, I think it's showing that um, a serious attempts in developing electric planes using superconductor will be realized. To summarize, global environment challenges are really hitting us very, very quickly. I mean, this year, I showed some examples what happened this year in Europe, in the flooding in Europe, California fires, 
even rain unite the Arab Emirates with flooding and Greenland melting, which is really six times faster than in 1990. These are serious impacts. I mean, the forecast say London, for example, um, central London without the barrier, without the flood barrier would be underwater in 20 years. So it's happening and really there's a push for um, uh, uh, solutions will address this environmental challenge. Um, uh, there's a target uh, of zero emission by 2050. It's an aggressive target. And um, superconducting uh, solutions will be an opportunity here for addressing um, some of these challenges by creating solutions with high efficiency, high power. Um, I'm expecting uh, the expected emerging market by 2030 will be in fusion. I'm, I'm, I'm confident in by 2030, we'll st we, we'll, uh, fusion will be demonstrated using superconducting materials, electric planes, uh, uh, small ones will be demonstrated, not using batteries, but also using superconducting, uh, storage systems, renewables, high field systems for research. So really start to see fast tracking of, um, of uh, applications and medical and diagnostic and so on. Uh, so to summarize, we are seeing the measure of new commercial superconductor application beyond MRI and healthcare. Cost of HTS is still a barrier and handling of HTS is still uh, need to be fully understood. Cryogen-free technologies are critical for future superconductor application, cost and de deployment. So definitely this is an opportunity to develop new solutions. And of course, fusion high energy physics energy planes are going to be a driver for new development. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is, has been really in, uh, interesting overview. Um, are there any questions? I think we have about, uh, I'm not sure, uh, maybe we start a little late. And, and anyway, a couple of uh, questions, if uh, someone from the audience. And some, uh, otherwise, uh, okay. There's I, I a question from Hall. Yes, please go ahead. I, I cannot. Okay. Good morning. Please. And yeah, um, good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you for such a wonderful lecture. For those of us who have been working for many years in superconductivity, especially starting with the um, high temperature superconductors, um, I wanted to ask you um, if you have an idea of whether SMES systems, for example, um, could be very competitive with batteries, with, which are um, devices that many people are working on, but have lots of problems. Yeah, yeah, I think they will be competitive. As I'm, uh, one of the barriers for SMES to be really competitive in the short term is the cost of materials. So, um, uh, if if the cost is, if you can make high temperature supercomputer cheaper. Uh, nowadays, and probably Arno has mentioned that currently, if you I'll give you an example, if you are buying a low temperature superconductor like niobium, you will pay say one dollar per meter, for example, for a one millimeter wire. If you go and use a niobium ten, you will pay ten dollars per meter. So the one dollar will give you ten Tesla system. The ten dollar will give you um, per meter will give you a twenty Tesla. And if you, uh, you talk about HTS, you talk about $100, $200 per meter to do the above 30 for Tesla. So the, the, the main, the main uh, barrier, the main challenge is how to reduce these costs. And this is like catch 22 situation. The cost of materials can be dropped. If you talk to any of these suppliers, say we can drop the, the, the cost of wires to say uh, almost um, a third or even tenth of the um, price we have now, but you need the demand. And the demand is not there because people want to use materials for research different from application. The only reason um, the European tenure became cheap is because of MRI. The demand for healthcare was so enormous that allowed MRI system uh, um, to become a mainstream healthcare uh, solution which allowed suppliers of these superconducting materials to develop cheap materials. So that's where the challenge is how to bring these um, materials down in price. Now, uh, Smiths offer a better uh, performance. So a, a battery, anyone is using a battery in a car, on a, it, you know that um, it will lose its efficiency by the third year. 
And uh, I think within four or five years, it goes to 70%. And car manufacturers said they recommend changing and get another one. And then you have the challenge of processing all this waste of batteries. So I think Smith is really offer a lot of attraction and will solve a lot of problems. Because a Smith system will last for 20 years without any degradation, if not more. So to see, to, for me, the, there are two challenges. First of all, the price. And then the second one is to how to handle these materials in the industrial environment. But I think the more we work on it, the more it will happen. Are there any questions uh, from online Zoom? Yeah, there is Dennis. Dennis, who has... Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I was a little bit surprised that you did not mention the large-scale industrial applications of uh, high-temperature superconductors in induction heaters. I have heard that this is the first, uh, the first really uh, successful large-scale application there is at, uh, at the moment. Well, I, I, there's a prototypes and demonstration at the moment. Um, no, 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 no. The, the company Biltman, I think, is selling these things. I have pictures of them in halls, in, in industry halls. Okay, thank you. Can, could you send me them? I, 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 I do apologize for this company. I, I do apologize if I missed it. But I know that I know they have been done prototypes. But if there's commercial, can you send me these pictures? Then I add them to my I, slide. I have a picture, but I can I can say uh, I, I'll just put the name on the on the chat. Maybe you can look it up. Maybe I got it wrong. That's why I'm asking the question. Uh, yeah, but, I, yeah. I think anyway. Uh, this is this is the name of the company. If you Google it. They got an environmental prize last year for that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I, I know there are effort uh, to do this, but uh, I, I know there's a demonstration using low temperature and high temperature. Currently, uh, in, I mentioned, for example, the magnetic separation because the really is deployed in environment. Uh, if there's a company developing that now, I would be very happy to have them and look at them. But uh, I'm expecting them to, within five years. We'll start to see more of these. Okay. Okay, maybe I'm anticipating things. I don't know. Really. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I, I, what, what I'm trying to say here, there's, there's a huge potential here. The cost is a barrier, I think. And, um, and I know there's prototyping low temperature and high temperature. And I think there's a lot of potential here, definite. As soon as the price of uh, materials goes down, you will see more of these systems in not a, a large factory, but even medium and small factories. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much to uh, Zayed and uh, this discussion. And I, I think uh, time is about finished. So uh, I think we have a coffee break now, right? Yeah. yeah. So And uh, so see you in about 10 minutes, I think, again. So let's thank the speaker all and uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good day. So that I can, so that I can, I'm missing the summer in Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for presentation again from Hall from Turkey. Thank you.